Commission Foundation is Virginia's leading peer-to-peer -peer recovery community organization. So if you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, let us get you connected. Build your self-esteem and lead you to a solid foundation in your recovery. Check us out. y'all should know. Um, and one, you're a tough act to follow. Thank God I'm 10 feet tall, right? <laughs> I was a treatment court judge, and I was real proud to be a treatment court judge. And I stepped down from the bench to do this because I believe that we all need to step up and make a change. I believe that we all can be the change and we can all do something. And you're going to hear that a lot from me tonight. But as a treatment court judge, I ran a drug court and a sobriety court, and I ran one of the largest veterans treatment courts in the country. I'm still very active with that as well. All my background, you should know, is in interpersonal violence, substance abuse, and mental health. Not only that, I come from a family that has um, really suffered from the disease of addiction. I grew up the all-American girl, I did, but from my grandfather to my great-grandfather to I have one uncle in recovery and another uncle that you know in recovery right? To my brother, who's 15 months older than I am, and he's about six feet four. You think I'm tall, right? He's a big kid and had a mean curve in high school until he suffered an injury, and then things kind of went sideways. So I just say that to you because I want you to know I get it. Now, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. I have to talk about the doctors because we all know that four out of five people that move on to heroin in this opioid epidemic start with a prescription drug. Harvard just did a poll recently and one in three Americans blame doctors for the opioid epidemic. The Journal of the American Medical Association and a couple of other journals, um, including the Annals of Internal Medicine in January of 2016, they said that actually 91% of people that survive an opioid overdose go on to get another prescription, often from the same doctor. So you can kind of understand how this happens, right? Just ask Gretchen Borden. Have you heard about Gretchen Borden in Massachusetts? She was suffering an overdose and she crashed her car. They treated her, EMS responds. They actually had to revive her with Narcan or Naloxone. So they do that, they take her to the emergency room, they treat her there, they send her home with about 60 Oxycontin and she dies of a drug overdose that night. What? <coughs> and then what about those young kids? I played nationals in volleyball. I was really good, but I wasn't even remotely as good as these kids that are featured in the June 2015 article in Sports Illustrated called the smack epidemic. Because you see, I'm gonna talk to you about, I don't know, 30 or 40,000 middle schoolers and high schoolers this year with my partner. And the two things that we hear every time we go into these schools from these kids are sports injuries and wisdom teeth. Let me say that again. Sports injuries and wisdom teeth. Look at how we value athletics. And these kids that were featured in this article, by the way, every single one of us should be giving this article to our principals, to our athletic directors, and reading it to our kids, because it's a perfect teaching tool. Because they were good, they were real good. And they suffered those sports injuries. And so when we think about them, what do they want? They want to be the best, they want to they wanna go on, they want to get the scholarship, whether it's the NHL or the NFL or whatever the case may be. Captain of the chess club, right? These are the kids that exceed. And they got that script. And what did we hear? Because after they got that script and they took that script as prescribed, what happened? They stopped taking the script. And then they had the migraine and the headache and the nausea and the vomiting. And no one told them, right? So when they stopped taking it and they didn't feel good, they knew that they still had to perform. So they took another pill because they knew that they, it would make them feel better. And now their parents lament, because in that particular article, three out of the four kids are dead from a drug overdose. And the parents say, actually, the parents testify. You see, I'm a litigator. 
No one told us. No one told us they were addictive. There are tens of thousands of people dying every single year. You know the data. You know the statistics. And despite everything that states are doing and the government's doing and we're doing, all of us that are here and all of you out there, death rates are still, overdose rates are still going up. I travel the entire country with my business. And we talk to doctors and dentists. We focus on that whole saying. No one told us it was addictive. Who's the no one? Docs, dentists, NPs, PAs, practitioners. They're the no one. In the criminal cases, we've all heard the criminal cases, right? People, doctors going to jail. But it's really the civil litigators that we need to worry about. Because the cases from civil litigation now are in the millions of dollars. There's one out of St. Louis, by the way. And this fine gentleman didn't die. No, because you don't have to be a decedent anymore. You have to suffer undue harm. And there were 17.6 million reasons why that jury said, you all got to pay. And there's three things, three things that I want you to hear tonight. Inform, monitor, and document. It's that simple. Inform, monitor, and document. So through my companies, the Stepman Switalski Group that you can see right here, through Switalski Consulting, and then through my law firm, Lippitt, O'Keefe, and Gormbein in Michigan, right? Got to get that little tag because we're working really hard and we want to make sure that we're all joining forces because the real goal, as I think you're going to see tonight, is to create that army. We've crafted the best informed consent document based on all the evidence and all the facts and all the guidelines. And it's out there and it's being used in major medical organizations and in solo practitioners. And it's working. It's really really working to inform and tell people. So as I move on, I want you to remember that I'm on your team. Not just your team, the practitioner, but as the judge and the former prosecutor and the litigator with a medical background, um, I believe that despite all of the adversity that doctors and medical practitioners face, like pain is the fifth vital sign, like marketing, like patient satisfaction surveys. Remember the happy face chart that they're using to assess pain right now? Talk about subjective, right? With MECRA and MIPS and all of those things. Can we go back to marketing for just one moment? Because think about last year's Super Bowl ad. In 30 seconds, we talked about constipation from opioids, right? And then in the second half, in 30 seconds, there was a cute little blonde girl that was a cheerleader that died of a heroin overdose. That's when you know you have an opioid epidemic in your country. Not to mention those Cialis ads. I will never understand why those people are in two different bathtubs. Listen, let's be the change. That's enough blame, right? We all have blame. There's plenty of blame to go around, so let's focus on solutions because that's really why we're here tonight, right? Let's be solution-based. So what do we do as practitioners, medical practitioners, and what do you need to know as the patient? There's a couple of things that really needs to happen. The first thing that you need to do, docs, dentists, all NPs, PAs, is take the patient history. How do we take that patient history? Because there are some pretty significant nuances to this history that we all need to be aware of. There's about 17 different things that you need to screen for. I would submit if you screen for the first six, you're doing a great job. How about family history of addiction? Yeah, holla, you think, right? How about age of first use? How about history of mental health? How about military service? and trauma, sleep. Let me go back to family history of addiction because that includes me, right? And nobody's ever asked me that. Think 
about how you define addiction. Can you really give me the medical definition for addiction? And this year, I don't talk to thousands and thousands and thousands of medical practitioners, and hardly a single one can give me that definition. The reason why I point this out is not to make them feel badly, because I can't tell you anything about bankruptcy law. It's not my area of expertise, right? But if they don't know how to define it, how do you expect your patient to define it? The National Safety Council said that 23%, only 23% of doctors actually ask that question. I had a gentleman come in on probation. He blew a .43 on a drunk drive, and he was doing a good job, right? <laughs> I'm going to give you the cliff note version. I asked him about his mom. No, to his knowledge, his mom never drank and never used drugs. I asked him about his dad. He loved his dad. His dad, coming from the Motor City, retired after 40 years with General Motors. Never missed a day of work, not one. That's awesome, right? Well, let's get back to the question, did he drink or use drugs? To his knowledge, dad never used drugs, but he drank. Well, how much did he drink, sir? Oh, he only drank, this is what he did, he only drank a 12-pack of case of beer every two days. So at minimum, that's a physical dependency, fair enough to say. So we take the patient history, we make it non-discriminatory. Whoa, I'm going over. <laughs> How about that? Don't play any music, Houston, okay? <laughs> Briefly, I'll get through this. It's gotta be non-discriminatory. Docs, are you gonna screen me, the judge, the way that you're gonna screen someone else? No, you're not. But this epidemic doesn't have a face and it doesn't have a name. And you've got to use screening tools, whether it's SPURT or ORT or some of the new better ones. And we've got to go ahead and engage in risk stratification. Trust me, they don't really know what to do. So we've got to educate them. This is about moving forward and creating systems. And then we've got to use informed consent documents. Call it a controlled substance agreement. Call it a pain management contract. You all should be looking for this too. What did those parents say? No one told us. So tell them the risks, the benefits, the alternatives. Give them a treatment plan. Remember, this is just one component. Controlled substances are just one component of a much bigger treatment plan. And if that component doesn't work, then shift to something else, right? Right. Referrals, cures for abandonment. Throw out that one page informed consent document because it ain't informing anybody of anything, y'all. And then monitor your patients. What I say, inform, monitor, document. Do that baseline urine drug screen. Let me tell you what, there's studies published in JAMA with 30,000 screens on a baseline practice of 7,800 patients. 62% of them had something in their system that wasn't supposed to be there or had something that was supposed to be in there that wasn't there. So docs, how do you know what you're doing? Our veterans die of suicide. They're doubling down oftentimes. They die of cardiac arrest, respiratory failure. That could be in your toxicology report. Do that regular and random testing. Run your PDMPs. Yes, even you in Missouri, that in my opinion still doesn't have a PDMP and I grew up there, so I can say that. <laughs> Do your pill counts. Monitor, monitor for aberrant screens. If they come in angry, if they're getting their pills done early, you should know all of those things. You should be watching them because it's a treatment plan, and if the treatment plan doesn't work, you have to change the treatment plan. There's so much more that I could tell you about this. There's so much more to teach you, but if you can just start here, you're gonna do really well. The last thing you need to do, all of us, is to document, because you need to inform and you need to monitor. But if you're not documenting that you're informing and monitoring, then you're not doing it. Before I go, because they really are going to start playing music on me. <laughs> I'm a firm believer of asking for forgiveness rather than permission, John. You should know that about me. Listen, I truly believe that together, together, we really can make a difference. I believe that we can make an 
an impact on the greatest drug epidemic our country has ever seen just by implementing a few steps, by talking, by continuing the conversation, by asking the questions, I promise you, I will remain unstoppable in this endeavor. And I'm prepared to help you get there too. So cast that stone. Be the change. Do something. Thank you.